I'm so glad to be here. My family's here, Andrea and Kenton and Alyssa. Give it up for them. They've traveled with me. I bring you greetings, actually, from uh, Res Life Granville. And actually, today is their, well, today they're celebrating the 50th anniversary as a church. In November, they'll be 50 years old. And actually, I believe this church is one of the reasons uh, they're here is, is Pastor Paul and Colleen under Pastor Dwayne. So that's awesome. They're having a big celebration uh, this afternoon. So I'm just bringing you greetings from Pastor Dwayne and Jeannie Vanderklok, who are my pastors. But we're going we're gonna to talk today and, uh, about what your job is. All right, the name of this title is, What Letter Will You Use? What Letter Will You Use? That's the title today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for today. God, we thank you that you've given us another day to live and to breathe and to move. God, I pray that you would just speak to me and speak through me. God, that we would receive the word that you have for us today. We thank you, God, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, you have an awesome team with Lauren and the worship team. Give them a hand. Aren't they awesome? <laughs> Lauren's great. Getting to know her and we speak regularly um, along with some other worship leaders. I, I worship lead as well and and she loves her team here. She loves this church, her family. And you are, you are very blessed to have her because she's very passionate about what she does. And, and you know, to, to do what you do, it's, anyone can get up and play an instrument. I play an instrument. I play bass and drums and keys. And there are a lot of musicians out there. But to have passion and to do it for Christ, that's a whole other level. And, and she is awesome. And I appreciate her. And make sure you guys do that too. <laughs> little plug, little plug. She didn't hear it, so you got to tell her I said it. <laughs> All right, so what is your job? As a show of hands, let me, I'm going to ask a question. If you're in banking, just raise your hand if you're, if you're here and you're in the banking industry. Anybody in banking? How about teacher? Any teachers in the room? Anybody teachers? Ah, yes, I see some teachers. Awesome. How about in construction? Anyone in construction? Raise your hand if you're in construction. It's awesome. How about ministry? Anybody in ministry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. Awesome there. How about any homemakers here? Homemakers, yes. Actually, everybody should be raising their hand on that one. <laughs> All right, uh, anybody in the factory, working in the factories? Awesome, we need that. Doctors or medical field? Anybody in the... All right, all right. How about, how about in the uh, restaurant business? Anybody in the restaurant business? Anybody? I see, I see some hands there. Yeah, the list goes on. You know, I suppose in these jobs that you know what your job description is. Right? It's, it's difficult to do your job if you don't know how you're supposed to do it. A banker, they're supposed to be able to count money, right? I hope that they can count. Otherwise, it won't go well. I, you know, I, actually, I was in banking. When I, when I graduated from, uh, from Western, my first job out of college, I worked for what, what then was Old Kent Bank, which is now Fifth Third. Remember that? So I had to go through all this training. And um, one of the things we had to do, we, I was in the assistant manager program. But the first thing they had to tell us and show us how to do was run a, um, a teller, you know, so we're in a window. And the biggest thing was make sure at the end of the day, what are you supposed to do? Balance. Balance. So you're all nervous. You're sitting there like, oh, my gosh, I hope I'm not off. I hope I'm not off. That was, that was a little bit stressful. But that only lasted for very long. <laughs> but I went out to do something else. Teachers need to be good with kids, right? Be good with people. Smart, I hope right? That helps. If you're a factory or in construction, you need to be good with your hands, right? That's a gift. Some, some, some folks, I say this, can just look at something and it will just fix. You know, they just look at it and it just, it just, they just know how to figure it out. They don't even need to look at directions. They can just get the right tools and they fix it. How many of you know people like that? I mean, it, it, it frustrates you because you can't do it, but you need them because you, you, we all call them, right? Restaurant business should be able to cook, Right? Servant's heart, maybe serving people. For me, yeah, I'm in a restaurant business where I, I like to eat. So <laughs> I keep them in business. <laughs> Anybody like to eat in here? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to get back because we're going to have a picnic and I'm going to do a lot of eating. Mm. Well, in order to do a good job, you have to know what's expected of you. You need to know the right tools and have the right tools to do your job. You need to be trained. No one should expect you to do a good job by just throwing you at the, at the job without giving you something, right? 
Sometimes they might do that. They say, here you go. They give you a uniform. They say, put that on, get at it. How many of you had that experience where, you know, they really didn't give you much and they said they expected you to do awesome? It's like they were expecting you to fail, you know, maybe waiting for you to fail, hoping that you fail. I don't know. Well, let me tell you an experience that I had. In college, during the summer, I had quite a few jobs, or I will call it a plethora of jobs. D&W, Amway, some traffic safety, safety place. Um, what I used to do is I used to get up at like four in the morning and I had to drive an hour and then get this sign and stand in the street and just hold a sign up and let cars go by while they worked on, on the street. It was a shining moment in my career. Uh, <laughs> I try to forget that, that part of my life. It was horrible. I, I remember waking up and it was raining. I was so happy. I was like, yes. And then I forgot that if I don't work, I don't get paid. So then, <laughs> but I was happy. I didn't have to go stand there and look, look, you know, look crazy all day long. Another job, Thornapple Meats. Yeah, I worked at a, at a meat factory. It wasn't too bad of an experience. Believe in music. Remember that store? Believe in music? Bought a, I spent a lot of money there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, my first experience in a factory was at Amway and Ada. Big company. Most of you probably know that company. I worked there for two different summers. But the first summer I worked there didn't go so hot. You know, I was on the line. And, you know, if you're not, if you're not used to that, you know, those lines can go different speeds, right? And you got to, they, they make makeup and a lot of other things. And um, I wasn't so fast and I, I didn't quite get it. And uh, it wasn't a fun experience. It, it was kind of like that Lucy episode. Remember that I Love Lucy episode <laughs> with the chocolate? Remember that? You know what? We have a clip of that. Why don't you just show that real quick? Yeah, my experience was kind of like that, a little bit. Except you can't eat, you can't eat makeup, so that didn't help me at all. Anybody had, a, had an experience like that with, with on the line where it's just too fast for you? Yeah, I, I had an experience like that. You know, in order to be successful, you need to know what your job is and how to do it. What do you think your job is as a Christian? What's your responsibility? I mean, what's, your, what's your job description? You know, God has given us everything we need to be successful in our job. You know, Romans 12, 1, 2 says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Then it goes on to say this, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's a tough word, but that's a good word. Changing the way you think. Wow. His pleasing and perfect will. You know, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, man, I don't know. I don't know if I really want to be perfect. I, I don't know if I really want to go through all of that. I don't, I don't know. You know, living sacrifice, what does that mean? Present my body. Well, this is it. This is your job. There are many things that God asks us to do in the Word. But it basically starts with this request. What this is really saying is he's talking about surrender. Surrendering yourself, surrendering your will, surrendering your all, your life. Everything about your life, surrendering it to him. That's really what God is talking about. That's where it starts. But then it goes on to say this, because after that, which is a verse that we really don't read as much, Paul says this, Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think of you, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Wow, that's tough. Don't think you are better than you really are. Hmm. Why don't you look at the person next to you and, and say this. Say, you're, you're not all that. Just go ahead, say that. You're not all that. 
You're not all that. We've all said that before to somebody, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes we need to say that to ourselves, right? Why don't we say to ourselves, just say to say, I'm not all that. I'm not all that. I'm not all that. We really need God. You know, what God is saying right here is, you know what, don't think, don't think you're all that good. Sometimes we can think because we read the Bible or we come to church or, or even if we tithe that, we got it, that we're all good. But God is calling us to live a daily, daily life surrendering to him. That's what he's calling us to do. So our job as a Christian is not to respond the way a non-Christian would respond. We have to decide what vowel or letter we're going to use. What do I mean by that? When we go through a tough situation, maybe get mistreated by someone, we have to decide if it's going to make us bitter or if it's going to make us better. Right? I choose the letter E instead of the letter I. I choose to get better, make the situation better. Better. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We really live by that. You may say, well, how do we do that? How do, how do I do that? It's difficult sometimes. Well, James 1, this is a familiar passage here. Not maybe the most popular passage, but this is what it says. It says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, and, and believe me, they come, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. That scripture troubles me sometimes. You know, I say, all right, God, I don't, mediocrity is okay for me. That's good enough. <laughs> I, don't need to be, I don't need to go through this. I don't want to learn this. This is too difficult. But God is saying, you know what, you're going to be stronger after this. How many know that's difficult? That's difficult to do. It goes on to say this, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything that they do. You know, one of the things that I've done for many, many years is I pray for wisdom almost every day. Does anybody in here do that? You pray for wisdom? That's something to do. I pray for wisdom. My prayer is this, Lord, please give me much wisdom and much knowledge. If you don't do that, I, I encourage you to do that. And it's not just when you're going through something. We need wisdom when we're going through a situation, right? God, help me to know what to do or what to say. But if you make that just a daily prayer, God will freely give that to you. You know, when you get that and you're wise, you're, you're more slow to speak, right? Some of us speak so quickly or too quickly. I do that sometimes. We're our own worst enemy, right? Something comes up and we're... We're right there. How many know people, somebody that's like, they always have something to say. They're always really quick. And sometimes it's good. <laughs> it seems good. All right, but we're talking about how to get better and not bitter. The Bible also says a soft answer turns away wrath. You know, but when you're praying for wisdom, God will tell you what to say or when not to say. Sometimes not speaking is the thing to do, you know. You know, many years ago, I was in a situation you know, where I was being misrepresented. I was being um, mischaracterized. I don't know if you've ever gone through a situation like that. Uh, it, it was so bad that I, I had a lot of close friends come to me and tell me about it. And they were saying, you know, what this particular person was saying. And the reason why I knew it was true is because I had two different camps that I hang out with saying the same thing. And they weren't, they weren't even talking to each other. I'm like, wow, this is, I can't believe this is happening. Why is this person doing that? You've been in that situation before? You know, whether it's at work or whether it's a family member or a friend. That's hard to deal with. This person even had the audacity to, to sit in front of me. We, we were uh, talking about something, and we had a disagreement. And, and uh, this person just said, we just need to fight. We just need to, they literally used that word. You know, we just need to just get it over with and just battle it out. 
Some people just love that. Some people love adversity. Some people love drama. They always want something going on. You know people like that? I mean, if you know people like that, make sure you don't hang around them, <laughs> okay? They're not good for you. You know, but I had a decision to make during that time. I prayed with my wife. We were, you know, it was very tough. It was very difficult. When he said that, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was sitting there, and I couldn't believe that was happening. And, and, you know, in those moments, sometimes I think, you know, I look up and say, God, could you just close your eyes just for a second, just for a moment, <laughs> so you don't see exactly what I want to do right now. <laughs> you, you've been in that situation where you just want to just go off, you know. I didn't do it, praise the Lord, you know, but I thought about it many days. You know, but what, what, what's your job? What are you going to do? You know, at that, at that moment, I had a choice to make during that season that it could either make me a bitter person or bitter towards that person or it could make me better by how I handle it. In those moments, you have to remind yourself of this passage in Isaiah. Isaiah 54, 17. This is a familiar passage. It says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment shall you, you shall condemn. Let's, sing that. Let's say that together, all right? Let's say it. Here we go. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that? You know, sometimes we need to just say that. Sometimes we just need to say, you know what? No weapon formed against me will prosper. You're going through a situation at work. And you're, and you're wondering if the, if the boss sees it and, and you feel mistreated, you feel misjudged. Just, just sometimes you just need to speak those words to your mind. You know, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm victorious. I'm going to be better for this. I'm not going to get bitter. God's got your back. Don't you know that? As a Christ follower, God has our back. He's not going to let anything happen to you. I had a choice to make. That season was either going to make me a whiner or a winner, right? Any winners in the room? Any whiners in the room? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. To, it's okay. Hey, it's okay to be honest. We all whine, right? But what we're talking about today are ways that we can change that letter from a, to being a whiner to being a winner, because life is going to happen. So how are you going to handle it? What's your job? Remember the story of Joseph. Joseph was, was the son of Jacob. He was his favorite. Genesis 37, 2, this is what it says. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for, half, for, he worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. <laughs> so he was already favored by his dad. His dad already treated him better than the rest of his brothers. Yet, Joseph was a snitch, right? His brothers were out acting crazy, doing stuff. And Joseph is like, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell dad, you know, na na boo boo, whatever he would do. <laughs> I mean, they already hated him because he was favored, and then he's going to go and snitch on them. So their, their, their hatred for him even grew. His father gave him a special coat, but then what ended up happening is, as we know the story, Joseph has a dream, right? And that, in that dream, uh, he interpreted as his brothers and his family were going to be bowing before him. They're going to be serving him. He told his brothers about the dream, which wasn't very smart. <laughs> All right. Brothers hated him even more. They threw him into a pit, sold him into slavery instead of killing him. Ended up at Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh's wife makes a pass at him. He refuses her advances. He gets thrown into jail. While in jail, he, he interprets some dreams and some of his cellmates get out. And Pharaoh ends up having some bad dreams. And no one in the land can interpret those dreams, if you know the story. And he was really, really bothered by these dreams. They were, they were stressing him out because 
They seem like bad dreams. So he asked, does anybody can help me and interpret these dreams? So someone will remember Joseph in jail said, I know a guy. He's in jail. Get him out. So he goes, gets him out. Joseph interprets his dream. He says, your dream means it's going to be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. Pharaoh, elated that he told him that, grateful, appoints him to second in command. So imagine this. Imagine Joseph being in jail, waking up one morning, a cellmate, but going to bed in the palace. And one day, one day, that's what God can do for your life. God can turn your life around in one day. Do you believe that? That's happened to me. He can turn your life around in one day. Why? Because God is in control. And when you put your life in God's hands, then you can say those scriptures. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm going to be a winner. I'm not going to be a whiner, right? I'm going to be better and not bitter. And that's what Joseph did. His life was turned around in one day. Well, this is what ended up happening. The famine gets extremely bad. Joseph's brothers end up having to go get food. So they travel to get food, meet the Pharaoh, not realizing that Joseph was the one tending to all the food. So they meet, they run into Joseph. They don't recognize him. It's been many, many years. But Joseph recognizes the brothers. I can just imagine Joseph looking at God. God, can you close your eyes just for a second? Just for a second. <laughs> what would you do? What would you do? Think about that. Think about that. Here are your, here are your brothers are who, who actually were going to kill you. But one of the brothers, if you know the whole story, I didn't have time to go into it. But one of the brothers had mercy because he was kind of, he, he, he kind of really liked Joseph. He said, don't kill him. Don't kill him. They were going to kill him. Just throw him in a pit. You're looking at that and you have a choice to make. Like, what would you do? I mean, they're begging and you have the power. What would you do? Well, this is, what, this is what happens. He recognizes them. He gives them the food. He's not ruled by bitterness. He's not ruled by bitterness. He doesn't let that get the best of him. He didn't play the victim. He was the victor, right? The story ends with him choosing to do the right thing, with him choosing not to be bitter. God was able to use Joseph not only to save, to save the whole land, but also Joseph's family. That's what God did because of what Joseph didn't do and didn't get revenge. Wow. Listen, what I'm saying is you can't control everything that happens to you, but you can control what happens afterwards by what you do, by your response. Do you believe that? You can choose the right vowel. You can choose the right letter. You can choose to be better and not bitter, to be a victor and not a victim. You can choose to be a winner and not a whiner. You know, I'm wondering if some of us here are struggling with that, maybe with bitterness. You know, God wants to take care of that today. While I was preparing for this message, you know, I, I, God was telling me to talk to you about bitterness today talk about bitterness. You know, sometimes bitterness can sneak up on you. You know, you don't realize it until you look back and, and you realize that there's something in you about this particular person or situation and, and it's gotten out of hand. So I want you to think about that today. I felt God saying that we need to deal with that. You don't have to leave carrying that weight. It's way too heavy. God didn't design us to carry that much weight. We're not strong enough. We're not smart enough to get rid of it. We're not. Only God can do that. Do you believe that? What happens when bitterness wells up in you is that it spreads. And it spreads to your friends. It spreads to your family, to your loved ones. And before you know it, there's way more people that are struggling with the things that you're struggling with, and you don't even realize it. That's how dangerous it is. It spreads. But this is the key. Bitterness is something you choose to have. 
just like you choose the wrong letter. You choose to have that by the choices that you make. But God can help you change that I to an E. God can help you change your situation around. God can help you do that. Your job as a Christian, or better yet, a disciple, which is a Christ follower, is to do your best to do the right thing when, when life happens, when challenges come your way. When you get a bad report, or when a friend turns on you, or when you fall down. Do you know that when you go through things like that, it's not just for your purpose to get out of that? People are watching you. Do you know that? I, you know, I went through a situation once in life. Um, this is, this, is, what I, this, this is, in, is, is not in my notes. I went through a situation, and uh, afterwards, I had a number of people come up to me and say, I, I was watching how you were going to handle that because I couldn't believe what was happening. And I was shocked because you're, you're so busy, like, dealing with, with what you're dealing with, trying not to do the wrong thing. But people watch, and they watch, they watch Christians especially. If they know you go to church, you know, this is Nuevo. They know this is, this is a well-known church here. So there's people around town that know where you go to church. And trust me, they're watching you. If, if some of you in here have lost your job, they're watching to see how you're going to handle that. Or a family member, they're watching to see how you're going to handle that. They're watching. They're not going to tell you, but they're watching. But God has got you. God has got your back. God has got your back. And, and when you do the right thing, you're changing lives and you don't even know it. You're changing lives and you don't even know it. Do you know that? I know, I know, I know some of you in here hear what I'm saying. This is not planned. I know, I know that. We're going to deal with some bitterness today. We're going to deal with some bitterness today. Let's all stand, shall we? I'm going to tell you about something that happened to me. This is many, many, many years ago. I'm a, I'm a, I play, I, I'm, a, I'm a musician, and I play keys and bass, and I sing and all. And I'll never forget, I was in a service. I wasn't even at my church. I was visiting a church, just visiting. It was a midweek service. And in that sermon, that sermon was talking about um, forgiveness. It was extremely powerful, extremely powerful. I mean, it was powerful. At the end of the service, and I was by myself, I didn't go with anybody. I mean, there was a lot of people there, but I just went by myself. The pastor said, if you, if anyone in here has something against someone, go to that person and ask them for forgiveness. And it was very convicting. And um, they dismissed the service. And there's, and, and there's a guy that came up to me, and I was visiting. I knew his name. But I really didn't know him. I never did anything with him. I've seen him around town. You know, people that you see, but you never really talk to them ever, you know. And he came up to me and he said this. He said, Ken, I have been jealous of you for all these years. And, like, I forgive you. I mean, I mean, I mean will you forgive me for that? And he was asking for forgiveness. And I didn't even know the guy. And of course, you know, we had a moment there and, and, and God was working in his life. And I don't know what he was jealous of. I have no idea because he was an, he was an amazing musician. Amazing. But, he's, but he said that. And I guess the point that I'm making is you never know who's watching you, whether it's good or whether it's bad. You just never know. It's not pressure. God is not saying you better do it right or, or, or you're going to be in trouble. God is not saying that. God is saying, look, I have you on here because you're going to make a difference. And when you go through these trials, like it says in James, it's to make you stronger because you're going to help somebody else. Let's just bow our heads right now. If that's you, you're thinking of the...
you're thinking of that particular situation or that person. That's starting to make you bitter. Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a close friend. Or I'm just going to pause right now and just just think about that. If that's if that's you, just just take a moment. If that's you, with all the heads still bowed, just lift your hand up. If that's you in here, and you're struggling with that, I see the hands, I see the hands, just lift them up. It's not for me, you're just lifting it up to God. Just lift them up. That's awesome. I didn't do that, I didn't do this in the first service, but I'm gonna do this now. If that's you, and you're bold enough, just come right down front right now. Just come right down front, we're gonna deal with this today. We don't need to leave. We don't need to leave with leave the same way. Just come on down. There's no there's no shame. We're going to pray for this. Come on church. Let's give it up for him. We're just going to take some time. That's okay. Keep your heads bowed. Keep your heads bowed. Just going to pause some more. A little bit longer. If that's you just come on down. Sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves. It's okay. If some of you in here know some of the folks that are up here or came with them, why don't you just come on up and we're going to stand next to them and beside them, we're going to encourage them, we're going to hold them up. Just come on out. Just come on up. It's okay. We're going to pray. It's all right, just come on and just gather around those, those that you know, maybe your loved ones or family members, and just hold them up. I know some people where bitterness has destroyed people. It's destroyed them. I can think of one person right now in my mind that's been struggling it for 10 years. I can, I can, I can, I can say this person's name right now. And it has a thread through every single part of this person's life. And they can't shake it. Don't let this be you. I'm going to say a prayer and then we're going to say something together. But I'm going to say a prayer first. God, Father God, Jesus, I just thank you for every single person that's, that's come forward, God. Recognizing that you are their hope, and you are their source, and you are love. You've called us to forgive. You've called us to, to love. God, I pray that any seed of bitterness, God, that's taking root, God, would just die right now in Jesus' name. God, that they would be able to leave this place today with the weight lifted. And they would be able to move forward, God, and not be bitter anymore, but, God, they would be better. God, because you paid the price and you gave us the greatest example of how to love, we follow that example, God. Repeat after me. Just everyone in this room, just repeat after me. Oh God, I love you and you love me. Please forgive me for any seed of bitterness that I've allowed to take root in my life. Today, I release that to you and replace that with love. God, we love you so much and we thank you, God that you said in your word that nothing will separate us from your love. Nothing. And today, we leave better. We leave a winner and we leave victorious because of what you did on the cross. 
and because you are great and because you are good. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, everyone in this room said, amen. Just keep your heads bowed real quick. If you're here today and you've never made a commitment to Jesus, never. You've never said, Jesus, take control of my life. Take over. I want to live for you. If you've never said that, then you've come to the right place. If you've never said, Jesus, I'm yours. I turn my life over to you. I want to be saved and I want to live for you for the rest of my life. If that's not you, if you haven't done that right now, just lift your hand wherever you are. Just lift it if you've never done that. Make sure we have a chance to do that. All right. Well, Father God, I just pray that this word would not return void, God, but it would take root in every life here, God, and produce fruit that they will go out and, and build your kingdom, God. We thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, everyone in the room said, God bless you all. Thank you. Amen.